So in this video, we'll be analyzing the persona belonging to every main character in Persona 3, including Strega's, and how Greco-Roman mythology in particular influenced each character's respective arts. Just a heads up, this is a higher quality redo and compilation of the 10 part series I did 4 years ago, and I'll be doing the same with my Arcana slash Fool's Journey analysis soon as well. Keep in mind which Persona 3 persona and or character is your favorite so you can let me know in the comments, but without further ado, let's dive right in, starting with Junpei and Chidori. So Junpei starts off with the persona Hermes. Hermes is the second youngest of the 12 Olympian gods and is known as a patron and protector of travelers and thieves, orators and wit, athletics and sports, and invention and trade. How fitting it is then that these traits strongly match those of the magician Arcana and Junpei's personality as a result. He's demonstrated plenty of oratory skill and clever wit with his storytelling during the ghost incidents and the spontaneous ideas he comes up with at various points in the game, like Operation Babe Hunt. He's essentially the inventor of fun ideas that boost morale, like the good old sushi party to celebrate defeating the final full moon boss. Later, his actions become a brief link to Strega in the form of his relationship with Chidori, perhaps a symbol of Hermes' diplomacy and trade skills. He literally both exchanges and gains something through Chidori's sacrifice, since he loses his love, but at the same time regains his life. Junpei's love of baseball, his athletic nature, and the fact that his persona is a physical bruiser fits with the athletic prowess of the Greek god. And the winged design of his persona takes inspiration from the winged cap and sandals that Hermes himself was known to wear. Now, going back to the Magician Arcana for a moment, I mentioned in the Arcana slash Tarot Archetypes video that the Magician's cleverness and wit can manifest in the cunning of a trickster. And what do you know? This archetype fits Hermes perfectly, since he was known to be a crafty god, who would outwit the others for his own personal amusement, such as when he stole Apollo's sacred cattle. Sometimes Hermes served as a guide to the heroes, while in other stories he was a trickster who'd prevent them from reaching their goal. It all depended on his own whims and what he wished to do in the moment. Similarly, Junpei demonstrates this selfish and narcissistic nature early on in the game, when he defies the other Seas members and runs off on his own during the second full moon operation. Much of his early struggles have to do with his jealousy towards the MC, who's constantly taking the spotlight that Junpei believes should be his. It gets to the point that he further displays this trickster nature by outright lying to Chidori, crafting a story that places him as the leader of the group instead. But eventually, Junpei does grow to embody the side of Hermes that serves as a guide and protector for the heroes. This protection is symbolized via his persona's moveset, which includes Repatra that helps an opponent who's been downed, and Rakukaja, which strengthens his ally's defenses. The symbolism as a guiding figure is also further touched on in The Answer, where he serves as a voice of reason amongst the infighting of the remaining C's members. Though I'd say this role ties even more closely to his transformed persona, Trismegistus. But before we get into that topic, I'd like to cover Chidori's persona first, since Junpei's persona's growth relies on Medea. In Greek mythology, Medea was the daughter of the king of Colchis and became the wife of the mythical hero Jason during his journey. Having fallen in love with him, she agreed to help him obtain the golden fleece he sought after if he took her with him in exchange. Now when it comes to Medea's design, the ram head and her ability to disrupt Fuka's sensing powers are representative of her successful deceit of King Peleus, the one who initially sent Jason to retrieve the fleece. Now upon Jason's return, King Peleus refused to allow him to keep it. So Medea sought to kill this king. 
She preyed upon his desire to restore his youth and promised that she could restore an old ram into a young one again by cutting it up and boiling it with magic herbs. King Peleus and his daughters were somehow convinced, Bruh. and so he was cut up and thrown into the pot, successfully disposing of him. Medea's ability to restore youth wasn't a complete lie though, since she was able to restore Jason's aging father to his former youthfulness. This skill manifests in Chirori's ability for potent healing and in the passive skill Spring of Life that was passed on to Junpei after her death. Now, Chirori's final betrayal of Strega in reviving Junpei was probably inspired by Medea's betrayal of her own family in order to obtain the Golden Fleece in the first place. You see, as she and Jason were making their escape from Colchis, her father would not allow them to leave without pursuit. So Medea ended up killing her own brother, throwing his body into the sea to slow her father down, since he'd surely stop to give his son a proper burial. While Chirori's betrayal wasn't as drastically violent on her end, she was willing to leave her former family, in this case Strega, behind. Finally, in regards to Medea's wish for Jason to take her back with him after he obtained the fleece, the fact that Chirori's persona combined with Junpei's perfectly reflects this since a part of her is now carried by Junpei wherever he goes. So, after Medea combines with Hermes, the latter transforms into Trismegistus. This is fitting since the full name of this mythical figure, Hermes Trismegistus, was said to be the Greek god Hermes and the Egyptian god Thoth combined. Thoth being similar to Hermes as the patron of literature, science, and invention of the Egyptian pantheon. The red coloring of Trismegistus represents life and victory according to Egyptian color symbolism, fitting considering Junpei's victory over death. I think it's also fair to draw parallels of Hermes and Medea's fusion together to alchemical transmutation, seeing how Junpei's new persona only adopts this new color scheme thanks to Medea's original color. The alchemy parallel is important here, since Trismegistus himself was said to be a wise teacher and powerful alchemist who pioneered many subjects. His ideas even pioneered an entire school of thought, known as Hermeticism, in the 17th century. You see, the fact that Trismegistus is known as a wise scholar is demonstrated by Junpei's growing maturity after Chirori's death. It's only after this that he truly begins to acknowledge and accept the nature of life and death. This newly developed wisdom is then put to the test in his role of essentially mediator during the answer. He's the only one who really acknowledges both sides of the argument when it comes to returning to the past or not. He can understand Yukari's point of view, since he's tempted himself to go back in time to save Chirori. But he also understands that they must consider the cost of returning to the past, since doing so would mean they'd have to face Nyx all over again. In the end, he concludes that the stakes would be too high to justify, since their loss would mean the certain death of every single person on Earth. The fact that Junpei is the one to acknowledge this, considering how he started off in Persona 3, shows just how much of a wise teacher he's become, and demonstrates how he's moved away from his prior selfish nature back when his persona was still just Hermes. Now moving on to Yukari, her starting persona is Io. In Greek mythos, Io is the daughter of Inachus, the first king of Argos. In an ancient Greek tragedy, Io suffered terrible visions during sleep due to Zeus lusting after her. After she finally had the courage to tell her father of these nightmares, Inachus sought counsel from powerful oracles. They ultimately commanded him to thrust Io from Argos, lest they all incur a fiery thunderbolt from Zeus. Meaning that, tragically, yes, Inachus sent his own daughter away, against both his and her own will. As for Yukari, this tale may have inspired her background, 
specifically the instances where she and her mom were driven out of their home many times due to the social backlash towards her father, Eiichiro, the head researcher who was blamed for the massive explosion at the Kirijo company 10 years prior. Both Inakis and Eiichiro had no intention of stripping their daughters of their homes, but such things happened all the same. To add on to the Zeus connection earlier, Yukari serving as a member of Seas under Mitsuru is symbolic of Io's role as a priestess of Greek goddess Hera's, aka Zeus's wife's, cult. Now, taking a look at her persona's design, it's quite clearly inspired by the myth in which Zeus transformed Io into a beautiful white cow to disguise her from his wife Hera. But Hera eventually discovered this farce and convinced Zeus to turn the heifer over to her, which she then placed under the careful eye of Argus Peneptes, known as the All-Seeing. He had like a hundred eyes. In response, Zeus sent Hermes to kill Argus and free Io. So in revenge, Hera sent a gadfly to torment the now freed prisoner. With all these tales in mind, the blonde human figure that appears shackled to the cow reflects Io serving as a prisoner to the many powerful figures above her. The gadfly eventually drove Io mad, causing the white cow to wander around the world all alone, without rest. Similarly, the fact that Yukari remained secretive of her mission to discover the truth behind her dad's work and death is reminiscent of Io's solitary journey. Furthermore, the symbolism of Io seeking to restore her human form is heightened when we also consider Yukari's tendency to push others away, despite her actual desire to form close bonds with others and embrace human relationships. You see, Yukari spends much of the early game shying away from genuine human bonds. You can learn more about Yukari's actual desire to grow close to others in my Persona 3 Arcana analysis on The Lovers. As for Io's moveset, it's initially ironic that she has access to Patra, since it cures confusion, anxiety, and distress, all of which are things Io struggled with in the mythos, from the time she was receiving strange visions from Zeus to when Hera's gadfly drove her insane. But it ultimately proves fitting in the end, since Io overcomes her madness when she reaches Egypt. Io also has access to Recarm and Samaricarm later as Isis. These moves revive a fallen party member and therefore can be symbolic of restoring or even giving new life, which highlights the fact that Io eventually gives birth to new life via having a son, Epiphys once she reaches Egypt. But with that said, it's time to transition from Io to Yukari's ultimate persona, Isas. And yes, I'm sorry I have to say it this way. Unfortunately, my original Yukari video has been demonetized before. Isas is the Egyptian goddess of magic, fertility, death, healing, and rebirth, all of which represent Yukari's story quite well, especially in the answer. Like Io, Isas retains the symbolism of the wind element since the Egyptian goddess has been historically depicted with outstretched wings, and therefore has been called the goddess of wind. The spread winged imagery mirrored in the persona's design also highlights how Io is now free from her shackles and has been given the freedom to spread her wings and take flight. Isas in general has been historically connected to the Greek goddess Io, since her sacred animals include the cow. On the persona, this image is depicted by the cow head and the two pointy horns that happen to enclose a red disc. This disc being reminiscent of the Egyptian sun discs that are named after the sun god Aten, whom took the place of Ra after the real-life pharaoh Akhenaten altered the existing Egyptian religion during the 18th dynasty. On another note, Yukari's high magic stat is reflective of Isas's title as the goddess of magic. Isas was able to usurp the most powerful Egyptian figure, the sun god Ra, by utilizing this formidable skill. She conjured a poisonous snake, which bit Ra and resulted in his immense suffering and pain. Isas then approached him and claimed she could relieve it via her magic if Ra offered her his true name. 
The sun god finally submitted and allowed the goddess's powerful magic to heal him. How fitting then that Yukari is the most powerful healer in the party aside from Ken. What really stands out about the mythos though is its relation to Yukari's struggle to cope with the Protag's death during the answer. It's incredibly similar to Isas's journey to restore her deceased husband, Osiris, back to life. You see, Osiris was killed and dismembered into 13 pieces by their brother Set, the god of chaos. In many texts, Isas is depicted as the epitome of a mourning widow. Her initial grief was overwhelming and drove her insane, even sending her into a fit in which she cut off her long hair. This is reflected in how Yukari's ultimate persona really has no visible hair when compared to Io's design. Now eventually, Isas's grief turned to anger, which fueled her drive to find her husband scattered pieces to revive him at any cost. This is mirrored via the sheer lengths to which Yukari is willing to go to return to the past and see the MC once again. She's the most vocal of the C's members in wanting to use the keys to save the protagonist from his fate. And similarly to Isas, at the beginning of the answer, Yukari drowned herself in cram school to try and contain her overwhelming grief. When C's is given the chance to return to the past, she states that if there is a way to bring him back, then she'll take that chance no matter the cost. She's willing to fight the others for the right to use the true key, and even after her defeat to Aegis, she still tries to forcibly take this key from her. Yukari's motivation in both the journey and the answer is triggered by the deceased men in her life, as in her father and the MC respectively. But while Isas's backstory seems to have inspired Yukari's main struggle in the answer, she ultimately gives up her fruitless chase when confronted with the truth of what happened. She finally understands the willing sacrifice the Protag made, since there was no other way to protect the world and all of life but to become the seal. Then Yukari apologizes to Aegis, and is the first to suggest they return back to their present time of April 1st, with the intent of wanting to protect the Protag's memory by living her life to the fullest. On a final note, if you're curious to know more about Yukari's grief and the answer in Japanese cultural context, you can check out the video I did in the cards above. Now moving on to Mitsuru, she starts off with the persona Penthesilea. In Greek mythology, Penthesilea is the daughter of the war god Ares and the Amazonian queen Otrira. She had three sisters, who all have their own tales in the mythos. And speaking of which, one of the most notable tales to Penthesilea's name involves the role she played in the death of one such sister. While some versions of the story detail Heracles killing Hippolyta, most point to Penthesilea as the responsible party. Some tales say it was an accident during battle, though others insist it was during a hunting trip gone wrong. Either way, the main takeaway is that Penthesilea was consumed by guilt following her sister's death. And so, believing she was deserving of death in return, Penthesilea went on to become the Amazonian queen, a fierce warrior who led her charges into the fray, since falling in battle was seen as the only way to die honorably. Mitsuru's background takes inspiration from this tale in quite a number of ways. First off, she blames herself for the Kirijo company's failings and the lives that were lost due to her grandfather's experiments. She believes that all the blood spilled of so many researchers, especially Yukari's dads, can be placed on her family's name. The fact Mitsuru held no intention nor responsibility for the deaths of these people draws parallels to how Penthesilea had no intention of bringing harm to her own sister. And just like the mythos, Mitsuru takes on the mantle of leadership in order to atone for her grandfather's deeds. She becomes the initial leader of Seas back when it was just her, Akihiko, and Shinji, and also goes on to become student council president of Gekokan High. Not only is she a leader, but Mitsuru mirrors Penthesilea's position as a warrior, demonstrated by her great prowess against the shadows. 
She has been at war with them for a number of years before the later editions of Seas even gained their personas. In other words, she has developed a veteran's experience in battle. Mitsuru's great damage output stemming from her high magic stat and powerful ice skills, as well as her not too shabby physical attack stat, really pack a punch. Also, the fact that she served as Seiza's navigator before Fuka showed up demonstrates her persona skill in gathering reconnaissance, just as Amazonian warriors were surely required to gather recon on the enemy forces. Penthesilea's design embodies this warrior image as well, via the breastplate and helmet which reflects a knight's armor. Additionally, the fact that the right breast appears to be missing is symbolic of the great legend surrounding the female Amazonians and how they would cut one breast to become stronger in battle. As for the crown adorning her head, it symbolizes Mitsuru's position as student council president and leader of seas. Well, besides the MC, of course. Though you know what's interesting? How her persona wields both a dagger and a fencing sword. In metaphorical terms, a dagger is usually seen as a treacherous weapon, one that's used to backstab another, such as when Brutus assassinated Julius Caesar. But taking the sword in contrast, it's been historically seen as an honorable weapon that was wielded by knights. So I'd argue that the dagger reflects the nefarious scheming of the Kirijo group when it was still under the leadership of Mitsuru's grandfather with that legacy having been transferred to Mitsuru and how, albeit unknowingly, she was wielding Ikutsuki's continued treachery throughout the game, what with defeating the full moon bosses to bring about the fall. But in actual battle, Mitsuru doesn't wield a dagger, but her fencing sword instead, symbolizing her actual intent to use Penthesilea's powers for good via fighting to protect others. I also believe that the helmet covering her persona's face reflects part of Penthesilea's mythology. Achilles was the one to finally slay this Amazonian queen in battle, only to fall in love with her once the helmet fell from her face. The fact that Achilles was so charmed by the now deceased warrior may be the inspiration for Marin Karen's inclusion in Penthesilea's move pool. And just maybe the reason Mitsuru misses so often is because her persona's face is obstructed by a helmet. Legit though, just set Mitsuru to full assault and you won't ever have this problem. Anyway, this next bit doesn't fit directly with the mythos per se, but I think the helmet may also serve as a symbolism for Mitsuru's personal struggles. You see, our student council president spends a lot of time sacrificing any personal desire of her own in order to carry out the wills of others. In the main story, she spends so many years of her life atoning for the Kirijo company, and she keeps her real reason, the desire to protect her father, a secret from all the others in the group until it's already too late. In this sense, the helmet hides the true Mitsuru, I noticed that the only other Persona user who has a facial covering of some kind is Fuka, which totally fits this train of thought, since Fuka's obstacle is also learning how to place her own dreams first, rather than being a people pleaser. But back to Mitsuru's case, even after Penthesilea's transformation into Artemisia, she still defers to other people's wishes. In her social link, which can only be started after she gains her ultimate persona, Mitsuru nearly goes along with an arranged marriage for the sake of the company. This struggle also transfers over to her support of Yukari during the answer. But before I dive into that, let's cover Artemisia's background as a historical figure. Yep, you heard that right, Mitsuru's final persona is based on a queen that existed in real life. Artemisia I became queen of Halicarnassus following the death of her husband. Once again, this reflects Mitsuru's new role as head of the Kirijo company after her father's passing. The most notable accounts of Artemisia in the historical record detail her exploits in the Greco-Persian War as an ally of Xerxes I, king of Persia. She's most known for her superb tactics in the Battle of Silamis, as recorded by one of the most recognizable Greek historians of the time, Herodotus. As for the persona's design, the elegant dress gives off an air of refinement, which is fitting for both Queen Artemisia and Mitsuru, 
since they're both high-ranking and noble individuals. The very human clothing reflects the fact that Artemisia is one of the few ultimate personas of seas that's based on a real historical figure instead of a mythological one. She retains the breastplate since it highlights Queen Artemisia's role in battle during the Greco-Persian Wars, though the mask is what stood out to me the most, since it no longer covers the entire face compared to Penthesilea's helmet, which reflects how Mitsuru has learned how to stand up for her own wants and desires in her social link. Though the continued presence of the masquerade mask in and of itself demonstrates how she still defers to Yukari during the answer. Lastly, Artemisia, a queen of a Greek city-state, was still a faithful confidant to King Xerxes. By all accounts, she should have seen him as an enemy, since he was the one responsible for invading the Greek city-states. But in this sense, I think we can argue that Artemisia's role in aiding Xerxes is mirrored in Mitsuru's role of assisting Yukari during the fight with Aegis. They try to obtain the true key by force, even though Mitsuru personally doesn't believe in turning back time. But she consoles Yukari after their loss, and reveals the vow she made to herself. A vow in which she would put her own feelings aside in order to fight besides Yukari, since this was her way of showing her gratitude for the support that was shown to her after the death of her father. Michiru's role in comforting Yukari also takes on a very motherly-like role, which is fitting with her tarot archetype of the Empress. If that interests you, check out my video on Persona 3 and the Arcana slash Fool's Journey. But speaking of real-life figures and Persona 3, let's move on to Fuka, who starts off with the Persona Lucia. Saint Lucia or Saint Lucy was a young Christian martyr during the Diocletian persecution of the 2nd and 3rd century CE. She's even commemorated by the Roman Catholic Church, being one of the eight women to be included in the canon of the Mass. The details of her life that have stood the test of time tell of a young woman who dedicated her entire being to the service of Christ, so much so that she refused the marriage her mother arranged for her with a pagan man. Angered by Lucy's rejection, the man revealed her faith to the governor and Lucy was then subjected to increasingly horrific torture by the guards, from attempting to have her defiled at a brothel to hitching her to a team of oxen to be dragged through the streets. They even heaped bundles of wood all around her so she'd be incinerated to death. Shocker, I know. But for some inexplicable reason, the wood just wouldn't catch fire. Christian tradition states that St. Lucia was filled with holy spirits that protected her throughout all these trials. Even after they gouged out her eyes and slit her throat, she was still able to see and prophesize. She met her real end only when she was put to the sword. So how does this inspire Fuka's story? Well, though she did not face the same physical torment, Fuka, in a sense, faced persecution from Natsuki and the other bullies. It got so bad that she was forced into and locked inside the gym. Eventually, these cruel girls started to worry that Fuka may take her own life, so they attempted to right this wrong, only to find she had vanished. To their disbelief, she was nowhere to be found despite being trapped there overnight with no way to get out aside from the front doors, which were locked. When C's got word of this, they quickly realized that she must have been trapped in the dark hour for ten whole hours, one for each day that she had been missing from the real world. This spelled nothing but certain death for anyone without a persona, given the dangerous shadows prowling Tartarus. But despite these overwhelming odds, Fuka managed to survive all by herself until C's arrived to help. She hadn't even fully awakened to Lucia yet, but she was clearly protected by the spirit, aka Persona, just as Saint Lucy had holy spirits protecting her. And just as Lucy had the ability to prophesize, Fuka has the ability to sense which floors the Tartarus bosses are located on and is able to decipher the regular shadow's strengths and weaknesses. The bandages wrapped around the Persona's eyes and throat are clearly inspired by the horrific injuries the guards dealt to Saint Lucia. 
Perhaps the reddened face and blackened skin symbolize burns or charring, since the guards did attempt to burn her alive. The glass sphere that Fuka stands in bears similarity to the shape of an eyeball, complete with a pupil in the middle. It's within here that Fuka is able to sense the shadows. Also notice how Lucia's appearance is one of the most human out of all the C's members' initial personas, what with her hair, facial features, anatomy, and style of dress. This is fitting since Fuka's initial persona was the only one to be based on a person from real life history, just as Mitsuru's ultimate Artemisia was. In contrast, the rest of Siza's first personas are based on some sort of mythological figure. And although Lucia and Fuka never see direct combat, the skill set and stat pool still significantly reflect St. Lucy's background. Again, the various scanning abilities reflect her gift of prophecy, with third eye literally symbolized in the persona's physical design. The high magic stat symbolizes such otherworldly prophecies and holy spirits which protected her, which is also very fitting of Fuka's arcana archetype, the high priestess, since she's the one who imparts knowledge of the supernatural shadows to the team. Curious to know more? Well, check out my analysis on the arcana in the cards above. As for Lucy's miraculous survival of persecution that should have proven fatal, this is symbolized via Lucia's high luck and endurance stats, and the fact that she has no weaknesses. But a little over halfway through the game, she discovers a newfound resolve that transforms Lucia into Juno. Juno is one of the three original Roman gods, along with Jupiter and Minerva, known as the Capitoline Triad. Castor and Polydeuces, aka Shinji and Akihiko's personas, served as Juno's attendants, along with 14 other nymphs. Hailed as the queen of the gods, Juno presided over the aspects of women's life, namely marriage, childbirth, and motherhood. Ancient Romans also believed each person was born with a divine spirit that would watch over them from the moment of their birth to the day they died. This guardian angel-like being was called a genius for men and a Juno for women, a concept which may have inspired Fuka's role in the answer. Igis became the new MC, accompanied by her sister Metis, and Fuka presiding over both of them as navigator basically made her the guardian angel of these two women. Shh, don't tell me they're AI. In other words, Fuka was their personal Juno. The Persona's new skill, Oracle, reflects this transformation from Lucia, a real-life figure, to something more supernatural, like Juno, a mythological goddess. We can also draw a connection between the skill escape route and the concept of the guardian angel, which ensures that the person it's meant to safeguard can escape to safe shelter at any time. The physical design reflects the mythos as well. For example, Juno, along with her Greek counterpart Hera, is often depicted riding a chariot pulled by peacocks. This imagery is clearly the inspiration for the peacock wings slash feathers that extend from the persona's back. And honestly, we can see a more mythical or otherworldly aesthetic, especially regarding the upper half of the persona's overall design. It now dons a face mask with multiple eyes, a thick headdress, and more surreal coloring. The glass sphere also has a more elaborate design, which fits the majestic depictions of Juno. She is the queen of the Roman gods, after all. The shape and location of this rounded sphere is also reminiscent of pregnant women and properly reflects the safe childbirth that the goddess was venerated for. But to sum it up, Fuka just generally comes across as a sort of motherly figure in the answer as she supports and guides Igis. This is also seen in her role as a peacekeeper slash mediator of seas while they were all arguing with one another over the keys. Fuka is very patient and helps nurture Igis' growth, ultimately wishing that she'll make her own decisions. And as we all know, our favorite toaster learns to do just that. Now let's move on to Ken, who starts off with the persona Nemesis. 
Nemesis is the goddess of divine retribution in Greek mythology. She mainly sought retribution for evil deeds, undeserved good fortune, and unchecked arrogance. Even though the initial meaning of the word nemesis was much more neutral, it stems from the Greek word nemein, meaning to give what is due. Due to this definition, the term nemesis initially meant the distributor of one's fortune, and therefore was neither good nor bad, but simply in proportion to what was deserved. I find it incredibly fitting then that the mother of Nemesis is Nyx, the goddess of night, who as we all know represents the final major arcana boss in Persona 3, Death. So wait, what exactly about this is fitting? Well, it's because death as a concept has gained an overly negative perception, just as the word Nemesis and its connotation. This mythology behind Nemesis has clearly inspired Ken's main conflict in the game his desire for vengeance on whoever killed his mom. Just like the reverse of his tarot archetype, which happens to be the Justice, Ken goes about his pursuit of Shinji for all the wrong reasons. Instead of wanting true objective fairness to be metered out, Ken's only concerned with his own bias and dealing his form of punishment to this person he himself has deemed wicked. You can find more about Ken's relation to the Justice Arcana in my Persona 3 and the Fool's Journey video. Now, the final example of how the Nemesis myth affects Persona 3's story is how this goddess was the mother of the twins, Castor and Polydeuces, which just happened to be Shinji's and Akihiko's initial personas respectively. The whole situation that leads up to Shinji's death stems from the death of Ken's mom, and, by proxy, the surviving Ken himself as he seeks out his revenge. In this way, Ken basically gives birth to the scenario where Castor is fatally injured before his brother Polydeuces. More on this myth will be explained in the Shinji and Akihiko sections. Now, turning to its design, Nemesis is quite clearly inspired by the more negative take on the term. The Persona's figure is seen with this wide-set grin on its face almost as if she's personally enjoying dealing out punishment, instead of staying as objective as possible. The color scheme of Nemesis also paints this picture of eerie or malicious judgment that's about to befall a person. It's oddly ironic given that Divine Retribution is normally pictured with a lighter color scheme to evoke the sense of the heavenly and holiness. The circle that wraps around the face of Nemesis symbolizes the circular nature of retribution, probably best highlighted by the phrase, what goes around comes around. The circle also separates the figure into two halves, reflecting how there's always two sides to a story that must be considered and deliberated before justice can be dealt. As for the Persona's moveset, the standouts are Hama and Hamaon, I can think of no better representation of Divine Retribution than a light-based attack that can instant kill. Cruel Attack, Vile Assault, and the other physical attacks are also fitting, since the dark side of Retribution, Revenge, is usually driven by the desire to inflict cruelty back at the offending party. On the other hand, Ken's healing skills are a reflection of this duality and how one can experience good fortune as well. Finally, the Persona's balanced stats mirror the imagery of the balancing scales of justice. Ken eventually moves past his vengeful desires, which spurs his Persona's ultimate transformation into Kalanemi. Kalanemi is a demon called Rakshashas in Hindu mythology, who is known to have gone through various reincarnations. It was said that he was cursed to being reborn as an evil being three times before he finally achieved moksha, which is when one achieves enlightenment and is freed from the cycle of karma. The one thing that tied all of Kalanemi's reiterations together was his connection to Vishnu, the Hindu preserver god. This is significant since Vishnu protects the universe from destruction and keeps it going, Similarly, the Persona 3 protag prevented the death of all of humanity and continues to do so by serving as the Great Seal. So how exactly does this relate to Ken? Well, Vishnu's 8th avatar, Krishna, killed the final reincarnation of Kalanemi, Kamsa. 
And as the latter lay dying, he dwelt on the divine influence of his slayer, and by doing so, finally achieved moksha. Just as Kalanemi achieves enlightenment thanks to Vishnu's influence, Ken turns away from his selfish view of justice via following the influence of the MC and the rest of Seas in protecting humanity from the shadows. Now when it comes to the Persona's design, the spherical and wheel-like structures around the main body is a reference to the pre-Vedic, or essentially the earliest Hindu writings, spirit form of Kala Nemi. Kala means time, and Nemi refers to the feli, or the exterior portion of a wheel. This is why he's referred to as the rim of the wheel of time, and is tied closely to the cyclical nature of the zodiac as is represented by the symbols on its arms. As for Kalanemi's lack of any facial features, this reflects his enlightenment. The Hindu demon is no longer subjected to another life, one as a cruel being at that. A major contrast to how malicious Nemesis looks. Kalanemi's faceless design may also be symbolic of true objective justice. Ken no longer sees through eyes clouded by his own personal bias or feelings, but he now takes other perspectives and evidence into account before making a decision. The best example of this is seen in The Answer, where Ken reacts with level-headedness and the desire to understand the truth behind the MC's death. And even when Yukari becomes agitated and accusatory of him and Akihiko, Ken never responds with personal animosity, showing just how far he's come since confronting Shinji. He no longer dwells on what has happened in the past. I mean, his mother's passing occupied his entire life, to the point where he was planning on taking his own life after avenging her, since that was the only thing he was living for. But fast forwarding to the answer, and he's grown to believe that they should focus on the present instead of trying to redo the battle with Nyx. Sort of like how Kalanemi finally achieved enlightenment and would no longer have to relive similar events in another repeated cycle of life. Now in this next section, I'm going to do something a bit unexpected, just as I had in the first iteration of this series. I'll be covering Shinji and Koromaru back to back, instead of Shinji and Akihiko. I get that it seems more fitting to do the latter, given the relationship Caster and Polydeuces have as brothers. However, in the context of Persona 3's strong emphasis on the tarot and the fool's journey, I think Shinji and Koromaru make for a more interesting dichotomy. Since both of them never see their initial Persona transform for reasons relating to the Arcana. Shinji's caster never evolves because he dies before resolving the negative aspects, or aka the greatest flaws, of the Hierophant archetype. Meanwhile, Koromaru is the only character to begin with the upright traits of his arcana, with his persona stats and growth reflecting that. Or in other words, he's a mature individual already. With that said, let's dive into the actual mythological symbolism, starting with Shinji. Castor was the twin brother of Polydeuces in Greek mythology. The majority of these tales revolve around Castor being mortal, while his brother Polydeuces was the opposite and possessed immortality. While they shared the same mother, they had different fathers, which likely inspired Shinji and Akihiko's backstories of essentially being brothers even though they weren't directly related by blood, what with growing up in the same orphanage since their early childhood. But why was Castor mortal when Polydeuces was not? Well, he was conceived by the mortal Spartan king Tyndareus, unlike Polydeuces who was fathered by a Greek god. By the way, more on Polydeuces in Akihiko's section. But back to Castor, his mortality surely inspired Shinji's role as the one to perish, leaving Akihiko to carry on his torch for him. Another part of the mythos that's particularly fitting to Shinji's story is how Castor and Polydeuces joined Jason on his quest to obtain the Golden Fleece. We went over how Medea was one of the most important figures in this quest back in the Chirori section, so in this light, Shinji reflects this tale via the help he extended to Chirori and the rest of Takaya's team 
in the form of information, with him receiving pills to repress the power of his persona in exchange. But lastly, just in general, the mythology of Castor and his brother were filled with great adventure and battle, which is showcased in Shinji's past history fighting shadows with Akihiko and Mitsuru as the three initial members of Seas. Castor's battle prowess is also seen in the Persona's stats, with its sky-high strength stat and great endurance. Its moveset also boasts the strongest physical attacks in the game, with names that are actually very fitting to Shinji's story. Ken's mom met her fatal end at the hands of Castor, and Shinji was death-bound in the end. Finally, the design of the persona reflects Castor and his brother's renown as the gods of horsemanship. These two have often been depicted riding horses in art and literature throughout history. Castor also shares the same hair and body type with his brother, Akihiko's Polydeuces. Plus, they both share armor that's fitting of skilled warriors. However, compared to the lighter color scheme of Polydeuces, Castor is completely cloaked in black. Black is historically worn in many cultures at funerals and when in mourning over someone's death. This is symbolic on two fronts. One being the guilt Shinji has over killing Ken's mom, and two, his own tragic fate in the story. Finally, unlike Polydeuce's healthy human face, Castor's face is gaunt with hollow eyes, essentially appearing already dead, as Shinji basically is inside since he's unable to let go of his guilt. It's time to move on to Koromaru's persona, Cerberus. In Greek mythology, Cerberus is the three-headed guard dog of the underworld and a loyal servant to its god, Hades. Just like Cerberus, Porochon was a loyal servant to his already deceased master, even defending the latter's shrine from the shadow trying to enter. In the mythos, Cerberus viciously prevented any of the dead from escaping the underworld, as well as barred the living from entering without permission from Hades. In a similar light, Koromaru ferociously fights the shadows with seas, preventing them from leaving Tartarus, while also just fighting to protect the lives of his friends. Now, some tales hold that the three heads symbolize the past, present, and future, while other myths say each head stands for birth, youth, and old age, respectively. Either way, I find that the cohesive concept that comes across when all three are together can be symbolic of maturity or wholeness, which fits Koromaru since he's the only character in the party to be the upright of his tarot archetype from the get-go. Now, one of the most interesting tales involving Cerberus has to do with his encounter with a mortal who had a special gift for music. This mortal was none other than Orpheus, the initial persona of the music-loving, mp3 player-touting, main character of Persona 3. Orpheus's bride was bitten by a venomous snake, died, and was then sent to the underworld. Afterwards, Orpheus could do nothing but play mournful tunes on his lyre, so the gods encouraged him to travel to the underworld to rescue his love. Upon encountering Cerberus, Orpheus played soothing music, sending the beast into a deep slumber. Perhaps this is reflected in how Koromaru is always relaxed around the MC, getting many opportunities to release his built-up energy when the protag takes him out on walks. As for the persona's design, we see the three heads and the dark coloring of the fur. The feet are in the shape of pitchforks, most likely in reference to the underworld and the common imagery of the devil carrying this tool. Now, this may just be me, but I'm gonna go ahead and say that Koromaru's persona doesn't look all that menacing. I'd like to think this is due to Koro having control over his animalistic nature, despite being a dog. This fits with the upright strength arcana's traits, which I go over in more detail in the P3 Arcana video. But finally, let's look at Cerberus's stats and moveset. Aside from his outstanding agility, benefits of being a dog, the rest of the Persona's stats are balanced, as a mature mind would be. 
Also, the power to cast fire and dark spells is well matched with the fiery and gloomy depictions commonly associated with hell and or the underworld. So to wrap this all up, in general, Cerberus was fiercely loyal, kind, and friendly to his master and all the denizens of the underworld, just as Koromaru is sweet to all the members of Seas. So whether we're speaking of the menacing guard dog of the underworld or P3's fluffy companion, there's no denying that they live up to the title, Man's Best Friend. But now it's time to finally cover Akihiko and Polydeuces. As we went over in many other sections of this video already, Polydeuces is the twin brother of Castor in Greek mythology. And while they shared the same mother, they had different fathers. The two are featured together in the vast majority of tales, but again, many myths depicted Polydeuces as immortal in comparison to the mortal Castor. To rehash the Shinji section, this is due to Castor having been conceived by the mortal Spartan king, while Polydeuces' father was none other than the legendary Greek god, and therefore immortal, Zeus. Polydeuces' resulting immortality likely inspired Akihiko's role in continuing on and being the one to carry Shinji's mantle after his untimely death. You see, in the mythology, both brothers were drawn into a fight during what was initially just a cattle rushing expedition. But in the skirmish, Castor was tragically wounded and killed, while Polydeuces was saved when his father Zeus threw a thunderbolt down from the skies. Heartbroken without his brother, Polydeuces, who, remember, was immortal, begged his father to give half of his immortality to Castor. The request was granted, and the twins were turned into the constellation Gemini. I'll get into how this may have inspired Akihiko's persona Caesar's design later in the video, but on another note, Zeus being the Greek god of the skies and most notably lightning and thunder, probably is the inspiration behind Akihiko's usage of electricity in battle. Speaking of battles, the mythological tales of Polydeuces and his brother were filled with them. This is reflected in Akihiko's past history as an OG Seas member fighting shadows with Shinji and Mitsuru. I mean, Akihiko was even in the midst of an encounter with a shadow when he is first introduced in the game. Polydeuces' stats also reflects this fighting prowess, what with its excellent strength and agility, and an endurance that isn't too shabby. Additionally, the high magic stat is likely inherited from his father's powerful electric element. The Persona's moveset is reminiscent of a skilled combatant as well, by weakening enemies with stat debuffs, then taking advantage of one's own damage potential by boosting it via that electric boost passive. Just the well-rounded nature of Polydeuces' access to support skills, healing skills, physical and magic skills alone should sell this image of a warrior that takes advantage of all resources available. Akihiko's own unique weapon of choice, or well, more like lack of one, is inspired from the mythology as well. While Castor was the brother more associated with excellent horse taming skills, Polydeuces possessed great boxing ability. Akihiko reflects this as the boxer extraordinaire of Gekko Kan High, who takes to punching out vicious shadows with only his fists at night. Finally, the design of the persona reflects Polydeuces and Castor's renown as famed warriors. To reiterate what we went over in Shinji's section, both are wearing the same type of armor and share the same hair and buff build. However, the two differ when it comes to the color scheme of their attire with Polydeuces' overall blue coloring likely a reference to his father being the Greek god of the skies. As for the red coloring of his glove and boots, bear with me as I go into some speculation via color psychology, but red is most notably associated with such things like aggression, action, and passion. And being the color of fire and blood, it's closely tied to war, strength, and power. So considering how obsessed Akihiko is with getting stronger and fighting against the shadows in the first half of his arc, it's fitting that he and his persona wear a fair amount of red. 
and considering that he's indirectly the cause of Shinji's death for constantly hounding him to rejoin seas, we can make the argument that the red-tipped point and glove symbolizes that there's blood on his hands. But as we know, Shinji's death serves as the catalyst for Akihiko's character growth, giving rise to Polydeuce's transformation into Caesar, a figure from real life. Now, the title of Caesar was eventually adopted by all Roman emperors following the assassination of Julius Caesar, a military genius who had broad popular support from the public. But Caesar's successor, Octavian, took this name in order to emphasize his relationship to his great uncle, who was his adoptive father. Octavian was soon given the title of Augustus, which meant the majestic or venerable, and was largely considered one of, if not the greatest, leaders of the Roman Empire. So although there are many who have carried the title of Caesar, I believe it's Caesar Augustus in particular who inspires Akihiko's evolved persona. For instance, the murder of Shinji paves the way for Akihiko's new persona, just as Julius Caesar's assassination leads to Octavian seizing power. In both instances, the surviving figure is fulfilling the deceased legacy in some shape or form. Akihiko looking out for Ken, and Octavian enacting many of Caesar's unfulfilled wishes. Now in the Persona's design, there is a smaller figure perched in a seat that's reminiscent of the physical seats of the Roman Empire Senate. It's fitting that it's dwarfed by Caesar's surrounding frame, since during this time, even though the Senate and Emperor were supposedly two co-equal branches of government, it was the latter who held the true power of the state. Also, please entertain this other speculation, but I believe that figure within Caesar's chest is also symbolic of Shinji's memory, that he'll always be in his bro's heart. Kinda like how Polydeuces and Castor were turned into the constellation Gemini. The pose depicts this figure as being deep in thought as well, essentially adopting the thinker look. This could represent two things, Shinji's trait of quiet self-reflection, and also Akihiko's book smarts and presence as a voice of reason. You see, not only is he a strong physical bruiser as a boxer, but he also makes sure to excel as a student. It's also very telling when he becomes a voice of reason to both Ken and Junpei after he gains the resolve that transforms his persona into Caesar. But back to the real-life figure, once he had a firm grasp on power, Augustus chose Imperator as his first name, which translates to Victorious Commander. He did this to make a clear connection between victory and his leadership. In fact, there were 21 occasions where his troops proclaimed Imperator after their triumph. In the same way, Akihiko is one of the most useful party members in battle. Seriously, just comb through all the Persona 3 footage, especially of Fez on YouTube, and you'll hardly ever see Aki not in the party. Seas simply can't lose with him on their side. Caesar Augustus also greatly expanded the Roman Empire and tasked the civilization with ruling the world. Design-wise, this is reflected via the globe the Persona holds, while story-wise, it's portrayed in how Akihiko helped Seas conquer those final segments of Tartarus in order to oppose Strega's machinations and, instead, advance their own plan to preserve humanity. The laurel wreath atop Caesar's head is symbolic of victory, and how Seas ultimately was able to seal Nyx away. The rest of his design overall is reminiscent of the attire, armor, and weaponry of Roman soldiers during that period of time. Later on during the answer, Akihiko truly demonstrates how he doesn't let the deaths of Shinji and the MC hold him back. Just like Octavian, after his cherished adoptive father died, Senpai only looks towards the future, to finish what they all started and to respect the wishes of his deceased friends. And like Caesar Augustus and his renown on the battlefield, Akihiko is completely unafraid to resort to force in order to carry out his ideals.
But now to wrap up the last of C's before getting into what I'll refer to as the final two duos, it's time we cover Aegis, who starts off with the persona Palladian. Palladian is actually an interesting example that's unlike any of the other C's personas. For one, it's not based on a mythological figure, nor is it based on a person who existed in real life. Instead, it's actually based on an object that's found in Greek and Roman mythology. And what is this object, you ask? Well, a palladium, which was also referred to as a palladian, was a cult image of great antiquity. The safety of ancient Troy was said to be dependent on this palladian. Now you may be asking, what exactly defines a cult image? Well, in the practice of religion, a cult image is a man-made object that is worshipped for the deity or spirit that it represents. Aegis's background takes loads of inspiration from this entire description. On one hand, Aegis is an artificial intelligence that was developed by the Kirijou group, meaning that she is a man-made object. And as for being worshipped, she is quite venerated by Ikutsuki, considering his obsession with using her to guarantee the success of his plans. The chairman is the most fanatical of all the characters when it comes to realizing his ideology that death upon the world is the best path forward. So it's fitting that someone like him, a person akin to a cult leader, is relying on Aegis, who he treats like a cult image. It can also be said that Mitsuru's grandfather and his company were looking to Aegis for the safety of their project. The same can be said for Tatsumi Port Island, even if they were completely unaware of this fact. Ten years before the start of the game, Aegis duked it out with the most powerful shadow ever to result from the Kirijou's shadow experiments. But she couldn't defeat it, so her only other option was to steal it away inside the MC. She did this to secure the safety and prosperity of not only Tatsumi Port Island, but the entire world, just like how a Palladian protected the city of Troy. Palladian's design was also inspired by Greek mythology and features various other cult images on its helmet and breastplate. Furthermore, its stats mirror how a Palladium was integral in ensuring Troy's defense in the mythos. All of Palladian stats are quite balanced, giving off an air of consistency that it's something you can rely on. Though Palladian's exceptional endurance really solidifies this notion that it's a stalwart defender that's able to tank hits for the party. Palladian also learns many support buffs to bolster an ally's protection, like Rakukaja which raises defense and Sukukaja which raises hit and evasion rate. The figure's attire is also Roman-inspired, based on what soldiers would wear on the battlefield, with the style of breastplate, helmet, and weapon of choice, this one in particular resembling a spear. Now notice that the spear only shows itself when the facial area of Palladian opens up, revealing the truth that there's nothing behind the humanoid appearance at first. This mechanized design of the persona fits the notion that Aegis is a man-made object and therefore has no capability to process human emotion, aside from what she was commanded to do. She even says so herself during her fight with Roji. A machine is created for a purpose. Mine is to defeat you. I exist for nothing else. This concept is further showcased in the main personal struggle Aegis faces throughout the journey. One in which she slowly becomes more human and realizes that there's more to life than purely just fighting shadows. In the first couple months after she joins Seas, her thoughts and responses to the others are very robotic and stiff. For example, when the boys first meet Aegis during Operation Babe Hunt, and later during the cancelled school festival cleanup, She's the only one who doesn't laugh during the impromptu comedy routine. And in late November, her response to Junpei is that she's merely functioning as opposed to living. But even so, this is also the same scene in which she truly begins to grapple with her budding human emotion. The fact that Palladian is wearing human attire, what with the toga-esque dress and the armor, 
shows that Igis has the capacity within herself to understand living life as a human instead of strictly as a robot. Notice how pensive Igis is in this scene. She's not entirely sure what she's feeling, but she is sure that she doesn't want Seas to suffer anymore. She then steals herself to protect the friend she has grown to cherish, even if she's unaware of this fact. Her social link also explores this gradual growth of learning to enjoy the mundane day-to-day -day life with her companions, a concept that's so central to humanity. She even says in her rank 7 that to live is to be connected to other people. And so, I guess must come to the acceptance that to live is also to die. One thing that ties all of humanity together is the fact that every human being will die one day. Meaning the more human I guess becomes, the more she must come to terms with the fact that all her friends will die eventually. I guess facing such a change within herself and having to confront these existential fears eventually gives way to her persona's ultimate form, Athena. Athena is the Olympian goddess of wisdom and war and was known as the patroness of Athens. The white toga-esque dress is symbolic of not only her new equitable wisdom now that she's discovered the meaning of life, but also her purity. Since Aegis is an artificial intelligence with a mechanical body, she will never bear children and will remain the virgin goddess, just as Athena is in the mythos. The Persona's design is also now fully humanoid as compared to Palladian's fake face. The weapon is now wielded by the figure instead of being a direct part of it itself. This reflects how Aegis no longer sees herself solely as a weapon against the shadows, but as someone more than that. Athena also dons a shield that likely inspired Aegis' actual name, since the mythological Athena equips a shield called the Aegis. The goddess was also known as the Helper of Heroes since she aided many of the greatest Greek heroes, including Odysseus, Heracles, and a name we've mentioned in previous sections already, Jason. Aegis too has helped the heroes of seas time and time again, even overcoming the programming Ikutsuki placed in her on the night he nearly sacrificed the party to revive Nyx. The goddess's backstory also inspires a lot of Aegis' struggles in the answer, especially regarding the tale in which Athena accidentally kills her beloved childhood friend, Pallas. You could say the P3 protag's innate skill with summoning personas, which would ultimately lead him on the path to becoming the Great Seal, is thanks to Ryoji having been sealed away inside him all those years ago. Since Aegis was responsible for this, she surely feels guilt over the MC's death. I mean, he even passed on while resting peacefully in her lap. In the myth, Athena goes on to take the name of her deceased friend, becoming Pallas Athena. Aegis does the exact same thing in the answer, when she takes on the protagonist's memory when she awakens to the wildcard ability. And although Aegis reverts back to her cold robotic demeanor for a time during her initial grief, her bond with Metis, the actual embodiment of her human side, ultimately helps her to forge a new path forward. If you'd like to know more about how significant the answer is in portraying grief for a Japanese audience, I highly recommend watching this video from my library. Finally, Athena values wisdom above all, mirrored in how Aegis approaches the true key. Her intention was to open the door that lead to the truth behind what happened to the protagonist. Unlike others in the group who were trying to use the key to fulfill certain personal ideals, Aegis approached the scenario with great discernment and only wished to understand what they were all missing. In the end, Aegis comes around and accepts her human side once again after witnessing the truth behind the protagonist's sacrifice. She gains true wisdom, the answer to life. And so, in order to respect the memory of those who have passed, she goes on to live her life fully and abundantly in the company of her friends. But now to contrast the uplifting note we just ended on, 
we finally arrive to the first of our final two duos, Jin and Takaya. I thought it best to cover them right before the protag and Rolji, given the close ties all four of their personas have in Greek mythology and Persona 3's resulting story. So starting off with Jin's Moros, Moros was a primordial entity, known as a personification of impending doom. He was an offspring of Nyx, the personification of the night, or death in P3's lore, and was responsible for driving mortals to their deadly fate. Some myth states he's also the offspring of Erebus, the personification of darkness. Whichever origin you go by, it fits considering how Jin and Takaya were working to hasten the fall via uniting Erebus and Nyx based on what we learn in the answer. Moros was responsible for the general misfortune a person might encounter in life, such as the loss of a loved one, financial hardship, health troubles, etc. He would basically carve a path for a person to follow towards their tragic fate. On that note, he was also brother to the Moirai, aka the three personifications of destiny. He would even direct their actions at times since he was the older sibling. The heroes and common folk would do all they could to ignore Moros in the hopes that they could avoid bad things from happening to them. But this often proved difficult, since he could turn himself invisible, and was essentially inevitable. In some way or another, he would bring misfortune to his victims. As we can see, Jin's role in the story takes quite a bit of inspiration from this primordial being. His work towards the arrival of Nyx and therefore the encroaching end to humanity reflects how Moros would craft the tragic ends of many people. It was Jin who'd help carve a path of impending doom for others via the internet in Persona 3. Earlier in the game, he set up the Revenge Request website where people could submit names of those they'd like to see assassinated, which Takaya would then follow through on. Then later in January, Fuka took notice of a popular screen name online who was incredibly successful at converting people to Nyx's cult. It should have come as no surprise that Jin was behind it all. It's also fitting that Moros is tied to the three goddesses of fate, since the arrival of Nyx meant death in P3's lore, and the Arcana reveals that death is fated for all people in the end. Jin also does all he can to help our reverse fortune arcana, Takaya, achieve his dream. Now, as for Jin being the most forgettable of Strega, this really aligns with Moros' ability to turn invisible in the mythos. In a similar light, Jin intentionally draws the least amount of attention to his own presence so that Takaya's can be elevated. He's content to be the man behind the scenes so that Takaya can shine as a charismatic figure who spreads the word of Nyx's salvation. This solitary tendency also fits well with Jin's reverse arcana, the Hermit, which you can learn more about in my Persona 3 and the Fool's Journey video. As for his Persona's physical design, in all honesty, it can be hard to spot the mythological connection at first glance. But if we settle on Moros' relation to the Moirai and their knowledge of fate, then the satellite imagery of the Persona begins to make sense. For example, NASA satellites are able to capture a bird's eye view of Earth and send back this outer-worldly information to scientists that wouldn't have been able to capture any of it otherwise. For example, what's necessary to make weather forecasts or predictions of fate. And just as Moros gave many the ability to foresee their death, Jin bestows otherworldly info of Nyx's coming to the world. As for the moveset of Moros, the emphasis on fire and dark skills during the first encounter reflects the mythological figure's role in leading others to a terrible fate. Fire and darkness are usually associated with destruction, with Mudun literally causing an insta-kill if it lands. Moros' expanded skill set in January just goes to show that he has an even larger arsenal of methods to defeat his enemies now. No matter what element they may be weak to, whether that be fire, electricity, wind, or whatever else, Moros can summon it to knock them down. 
And at last, it's time to wrap up our big bad trio. Actually, let's face it, gameplay-wise, they're definitely quite the pushovers. But without further ado, let's talk about Takaya's persona, Hypnos. So, in Greek mythology, Hypnos was the personification of sleep. Makes sense that sleep-inducing drugs are called hypnotics, right? Like Moros, his mother was Nyx, with some tales stating Erebus was his father. Of all of Nyx's children, Hypnos is depicted as having one of the closest relationships to her, as in, many of the tales told he would hide with her in her dreadful realm to escape pursuit from Zeus after lulling him to sleep one too many times. Fitting considering how Takaya has the most personal investment in fulfilling the coming of Nyx out of all the Strega members. Though perhaps Hypnos' most interesting relation is the one to his twin brother, Thanatos, the personification of non-violent deaths, aka the real form of Roji Mochizuki, the realized death arcana prior to his farewell at the end of December. Hypnos lived with his brother in complete silence within dark caves that received no sunlight nor moonlight. I think it's quite easy to see how Takaya's role reflects this mythology. The relation to Nyx is pretty obvious, and it makes sense that Takaya is the figurative twin brother to Ryoji, as both are working towards bringing about the fall. Hypnos having to dwell in pitch black caves with death as his only companion is reflected in Takaya's horrible childhood under the experimentation of the Kirijo group. Since he grew up with death as a constant threat, and continues to do so due to his, and all of Strega's, terminal condition, of course he has no fear of the end. Plus, as the being associated with sleep, Takaya puts many individuals to rest for their final time, which tragically includes our dear boy Shinji. He also causes humanity to fall asleep to their daily lives in the lead-up to the climax of the game. Many people were led astray to the cult of Nyx and became completely apathetic as they waited for the end of the world. If you'd like to know more about apathy syndrome's significance in a Japanese cultural context, I highly recommend watching my video on that linked above. Now, Takaya's actions in battle are reminiscent of the mythos as well, since he clutches his head and momentarily falls into what seems like a painful rest. He essentially sleeps, as in takes no action, for an entire turn as he uses his inherent mind charge skill. Now honestly, I feel like he should have had some type of sleep inducing skill, even though that could have been annoying, but I digress. Overall, I appreciate how Hypnos has no physical skills, since the mythological being was no physical warrior. Lastly, the actual design of his persona resembles the most common depiction of the Greek god as a young man with two protruding wings. And of course, we can't forget the most symbolic part, the persona's drowsy posture where he appears to just be lazily hanging. The fact Takaya basically just falls unconscious for a bit between his defeat in Tartarus and Nyx's actual arrival is just so fitting, and in the end, Takaya peacefully accepts his coming death for the final time, appearing like he's just falling asleep. But at last, we've arrived at the final duo and the last stop of this long journey we've undertaken in this video. It's time to discuss the protagonists Orpheus and Roji's true form, Thanatos. So, Orpheus was the son of two incredibly talented musicians in Greek mythology. His mother was the muse Calliope, and his father, Apollo, was the finest musician of them all. As a result, Orpheus inherited an excellent musical pedigree and became particularly adept at playing the lyre. This is represented in the persona's design, as we can see right here on his back. This likely inspired the MC's love of music as well, since you'd never catch him without the portable MP3 player around his neck. Orpheus's music had the ability to charm both animals and people alike, 
which is clearly the inspiration behind the protag's uncanny ability to connect with seas and so many other social links across Tatsumi Port Island. A particular story in the mythos is related to this, and that's the journey he embarked on to the Underworld in order to bring back his deceased wife Eurydice. As we mentioned earlier in Koromaru's section, Orpheus's music even charmed the guard dog Cerberus so that he could gain entry. Actually, it's super fitting for Orpheus to be the protag's persona in general, since Orpheus is the one that has the most ties to other mythological figures out of all the cast personas. Orpheus is also connected to Polydeuces and Castor, since all three of them were said to have accompanied the Argonauts on their quest to obtain the Golden Fleece. As we've talked about already, heading up this expedition was the legendary hero Jason, who received invaluable help from Medea, Chirori's persona, just as a dying Junpei received an invaluable gift from Chirori. As for Orpheus's role in this expedition, it was said that his music calmed the seas and protected the sailors from the terrible sirens that tried to tempt them to their deaths. The Argonauts wouldn't have made it safely back home if it wasn't for the gifted musician, and in a similar light, the Protag's wildcard ability makes him one of the strongest members of Seas, and a big reason they complete each Tartarus expedition safely. Even the entirety of the world owes their lives to the MC, who sacrificed his own to seal Nyx away. Now when it comes to the design of the persona, we already mentioned the liar, so I'd like to draw attention to something that's way more interesting. And that has to do with the initial scene of the MC summoning Orpheus. When the protag first awakens to his persona on the dorm rooftop, Orpheus is savagely ripped apart by Thanatos, which we learn later is the representation of death that has been sealed away within the protag. This violent introduction draws similarity to the terrible fate Orpheus suffered in his final tale. He was stoned and ripped to pieces by the Maenads for his lack of merriment after his journey to recover his wife Eurydice ended in failure. Death came for Orpheus just as Thanatos does to the MC's persona during the initial awakening. This may also explain its prosthetic looking limbs, since the initial body was ripped apart and must now be replaced by entirely mechanical parts. I mean, it took such a toll that it leaves the protag in a coma for an entire week. There's a little more to the scene when it comes to Thanatos, but before I get to that, let's cover the basics of Roji's true form first. Thanatos is the personification of non-violent deaths in Greek mythology, and is the son of the night goddess, the one, the only, Nyx. It was often said that he was a broken off piece of Nyx's spirit or essence, which sounds familiar in light of P3, right? This likely inspired Roji's role as Nyx's avatar in the final battle on top of Tartarus. And as we covered in the Takeya section, Thanatos was also the twin brother of Hypnos, the god associated with sleep. These connections are all very telling, since the leader of Strega and Roji, with the Protag by extension, are all responsible for bringing near death to the world. Takaya actively did so, while the MCNCs were tricked by Ikutsuki into doing so. Unbeknownst to them, by defeating the Great Shadows every full moon, they allowed all 13 split fragments to reunite with the final piece that the Protag was harboring within himself. This culminated in Ryoji's appearance and the encroaching certainty of death to the entire world. So, the human personification of death, Roji, is the one to reveal the terrible news of Nyx's coming once his memory is restored. Let me remind you that in the Greek myths, the touch of Thanatos is said to be gentle. Thus, the offer Roji extends to seas can be seen as an extension of this, since if they agreed to have their memories wiped, they'd have been able to live the remainder of their lives in ignorant bliss free from suffering. Now although Thanatos is normally associated with non-violent death, 
There is a story that refers to him as a merciless and hateful being after being outwitted by King Sisyphus when the time came for the latter's death. You see, when Zeus commanded Thanatos to chain Sisyphus up in Tartarus, the latter tricked Thanatos into those very shackles. This story probably inspired the initial demeanor and actions of the persona that so savagely ripped Orpheus apart. After being sealed away within the MC for so many years, it was only natural for Thanatos to viciously break free at the very first chance he got. This more merciless portrayal of the God of Death is seen in the Persona's physical design as well. What with the large sword it carries, its beast-like jaw, and the numerous coffins surrounding it. The various chains are likely an additional reference to the shackles that bound Thanatos to Tartarus. Now interestingly enough, Roji's design as Nick's avatar also takes inspiration from the mythos. In ancient times, Thanatos was depicted as a winged, more angelic young man, while later in history, he was portrayed more along the lines of the Grim Reaper. So Ryoji as Nyx's avatar seems to mash these two portrayals together. But now I'd like to return to the MC's initial persona and how it's connected to Thanatos when it comes to P3's main story. So Orpheus was killed by the Maenads in the mythology because he was no longer able to feel any happiness. This reason is so similar to the Protag's demeanor at the start of the game. Just apathetic and lacking any joy. I mean, in the opening cutscene, he doesn't even react to the dark hour and literal coffins around town. And again, a reminder that the MP3 player and headphones that are always around his neck can be seen as a way to just block people out. If the Protag hadn't opened up to C's and his other social links over the course of the game, he never would have learned just how precious each moment spent alive is. But because he did learn this important lesson, he accepts the reality of death with no qualms and willingly sacrifices his life to prevent the certain death of all people. The way he goes out in the very end is reminiscent of how Thanatos was most commonly known as, the god of peaceful, non-violent deaths. This makes sense since Ryoji was within the MC throughout the journey of P3 and learned the same precious lesson about life. This helps explain why he never returned to that savage Thanatos from the first month, and why he ultimately lets seize in on where they can challenge Nyx in January. Now in my original video, there were tons of comments asking about the persona Messiah. I usually try not to use anything that's not shown as canon in the main story, but I was enlightened and made aware that the Protag's ultimate is indeed confirmed via the end credits. So the Messiah, in simplest terms, refers to one who is related to the Divine, who will be the savior slash liberator. To this day, there is still debate among some sects of Judaism and Christianity of who the Messiah refers to, but P3 clearly adopts the Christian tradition which upholds Jesus Christ from the New Testament of the Bible. Though I think it's fair to point out how the final month's take of Revolver Jesus, leader of Nick's cult Takaya, versus the P3 Protag as savior of the world bears some similarity to this very debate. As for the Persona's design, the tall structure the figure is leaning on symbolizes the cross where Jesus was crucified. It makes sense not to go with a full-blown cross in the design since that'd be a little too on the nose, I think, though the actual pose is reflected later on by the Protag in the answer. Now, notice how Orpheus has a completely new body here. No more prosthetics or anything mirroring the completely new body of Christ after the resurrection, who had also suffered torturous wounds during the lashings and crucifixion. As for the Protag's part in the answer, this bears some relation to how Christians await the second coming of Christ. Similarly, until the day P3's messianic figure can return, sees vows to live their lives the way he would have wanted them to, 
fully and abundantly. And given how early Christianity has its exact roots in the Greco-Roman world, it makes all the more thematic and aesthetic sense for a messianic figure to show up in Persona 3. Overall, I just love Persona 3 as one of the best Greek tragedy-esque JRPGs out there. Its plot contains many elements outlined by Aristotle of what defines a great tragedy in the Greek stage-slash-literary tradition, the hallmarks of such being the tragic hero and the main characters encountering much suffering. Plus, I appreciate that much of the mythological reference is more than just simple window dressing. Ultimately, the ending of P3 isn't happy by any semblance of the word, but it's meaningful and adeptly fulfills the themes the story was building towards the whole game. But again, I'd love to know which personas, characters, and or myths are your favorite from this down in the comments. Also, please like this, share it, subscribe. This video is very much a love letter to Persona 3, my favorite Persona game. Check out all my other socials, and finally, a huge thanks to all my patrons, especially Big Klingy, Sam Bezjak, Francesco Santoyo Rego, M. Meowdalyn, Platinum Rose, Malcolm Lowry, Unholy Biscuit, Leviathan8685, Eden Corsef, Skarmillion, Kevanik, Peter Shepard, James Adams, and Andy.